So I believe there are no questions for the session. So we move on. Uh, I feel so honored and uh, privileged to call upon our next speaker, Dr. S. N. Singh, sir, uh, professor and uh, professor in the Department of Pediatrics. He'll be speaking on uh, control of infectious disease in NIC, infections outbreak in NIC. I welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pita. Thank you. Yeah, is my screen visible, Arpita? Yes, sir. it is visible and you are audible, sir. Yeah. So, good afternoon to all of you. I am going to present uh, the topic management of infection outbreak in NICU over next 35 minutes or so. So, the outline of my presentation is we will just going through some of the terminologies and definitions about types of infection outbreaks in NICU different organisms causing outbreak in NICUs, how to investigate and manage an outbreak, and some of the important example of outbreak and its management. So first of all, we should know what is healthcare associated infections. So earlier it was abbreviated as AHCAI and and previously called as nosocomial infection or hospital acquired infections. But nowadays, this terminology is not preferred because nosocomial or hospital acquired infection is limited to hospital. But HAI includes broadly even infection occurring at small healthcare facilities, which may not be designated as hospital. So this is a preferred terminology nowadays. It occurs when infections occur during process of care in healthcare facilities, which is not present or incubating at the time of admission. It usually manifests after 48 hours of admissions, and it includes infection acquired in health facilities, but it may appear on the day of discharge or a day after discharge. And it also includes occupational infections among healthcare workers. So, as it uh, represents, it has been realized that healthcare associated infections nowadays recognized as adverse effect and it should not happen. It must be prevented. And definitely, it is nowadays a point of litigation. Even. The prevalence, it is, has been reported up to 10% in developing countries and in developed, de developed countries, it is up to 7%. So it is quite common. So what is outbreak? So basically, outbreak is essentially an hospital, this uh, healthcare associated infections. And whenever there is an increase in incidence of infection above background level or rate over a defined period of time. So what can be this background rate of infection? So this basically, it matters, it differs from area to area and severity of the infections or infection by particular organisms. So this has to be defined at institutional or hospital level. So broadly occurrence of two or more similar cases of healthcare associated infections related to place and time. So that is outbreak. Even single case caused by multi-drug resistant organism may be considered as an outbreak. And you might remember about uh, New Delhi metallo beta lactamase producing bacteria that was Klebsiella pneumoniae, which was detected as a single case and it spread all over. So even single case, which is multi-resistant can be taken as outbreak. Outbreak cases are underreported even at local level, even at their hospital administration level, this is hardly reported. Less than one fourth cases are reported. About one 
कॉमन है ठीक है सो वट इज क्लस्टर क्लस्टर इज अगेन जस्ट लाइक आउटब्रेक बट इट मे नॉट नेसेसरली द आउट नंबर नंबर मे बी रेस्ट्रिक्टेड इपिडेमिक इंडेमिक पैंडेमिक यू ऑल ऑलरेडी डॉक्टर संजीव हैज डिफाइंड इट सो आई एम स्कीपिंग इथ दिस now what are the common healthcare associated infections so blood stream infection is one of the very common it may be central line associated blood stream infections pick line peripheral uh, this uh, vascular catheter umbilical vascular catheters hospital acquired pneumonia ventilator associated pneumonia this is obviously more common in preterms and where there is a repeated and prolonged intubations catheter associated unit tract infections clostridium difficile enterocolitis and nec surgical site infections skin and soft tissue infections and also sometimes even a diarrheal episode and some respiratory uh, outbreaks so these are the common form of outbreaks so what are the organism causing outbreaks so the important thing to realize that many of the nisu outbreak are caused by resistant pathogens and they remain limited they remain limited choice for antimicrobial so the important organism are methicillin resistant staph aureus enterobacteriaceae among this the important one is e coli klebsiella acinetobacter this is again uh, more and more cases is uh, being reported from various hospitals pseudomonas clostridium difficile fungal outbreaks varicella influenza and rsv even pertussis outbreaks has been reported from neonatal units and diarrhea causing outbreaks like norovirus and salmonella outbreaks so these are the various organism which leads to outbreak in nisc so this is uh, who has published a list in 2017 they have categorized various pathogen according to their uh, the resistance pattern and the priorities so in critical uh, priorities they have mentioned about acinetobacter domani pseudomonas enterobacteriaceae so there are lot of cases which are resistant to carbapenem and third generation cephalosporin so this is in on top priorities and actually uh, there is a need for doing research and development to produce to invent new antimicrobial otherwise we will really stuck into the problems uh this is an study from uh, south india over 5 years and they have uh, published the various organism causing infection so among who pathogen priority list you can imagine in order of uh, abundance of culture positivity so e coli staph aureus klebsiella pseudomonas acinetobacter these are the top bacteria which has been isolated from india uh this is a uh, just uh, carbapenem resistant trend in same study and they have reported that uh, there is a lot of rising resistance against carbapenem for especially bacterial group like enterobacterias and e coli there is another study uh, this study was from delhi the study period was 4 years 2500 new nets has been enrolled and culture positivity rate found to be 13% the major isolates were candida in 22% klebsiella and acinetobacter and again the resistance pattern you can see that resistance to carbapenem and even multiple drug resistance was common with klebsiella up to 78 to 84% and with acinetobacter even higher resistance like 91% so these are really alarming situations and another uh, study uh, delhi net study this is a very uh, famous study published in lancet and uh, three centers were uh, participated in this study one was aims was the nodal centers and then sabdarjung and maulana azad and uh, there were uh, 13550 uh, cases studies and 1005 were culture positive and most of the isolates were causing early onset sepsis around 2/3 and here you can uh, realize that 64% isolates were gram negative 
and Desinetobacter was 22% on top number, and then Klebsiella 17% and E. coli 14%. And once you see the resistance pattern, again, multi-drug resistance with, with Desinetobacter was 82%, Klebsiella 54% resistance, and E. coli 38%. And methicillin resistant among cons group was 61% and Streptococcus was 38%. So again, this highlights about the rising resistance pattern to carbapenem and multiple drug resistance and the emerging bacteria like Acinetobacter, Klebsiella, and E. coli. Something about Acinetobacter pneumonia because this is uh, one of the very important isolates from our nursery also and uh, from other hospitals also. So this is very uh, peculiar. This is found in environment, over walls, in waters, over surfaces. It stays in environment, remains life for a long time. It can withstand desiccations. Even it can stay alive under cover sleep for three weeks or even more. It contaminates very easily over the surfaces and it shared equipments. This is one of the common hospitals health care associated infection and especially in ICU setting. It get it easily colonized in respiratory secretions, catheters and wounds. Pneumonia, blood stream infections, UTI, wound infection and soft tissue infections are the common form of infection caused by acinetobacter. And very peculiar feature is it mobile genetic elements or transposon which is very easily shared between bacteria. So that's why the resistance can get easily, very easily transferred to the other bacteria. So this is one of the very important features. So that's why we are posing uh, with the resistance problem. And again, obviously it is difficult to treat because most of the, it is multi-drug resistance. Uh, you all know about the chain of infection, the agent, host and environment. These are the most important one. And there may be reservoir, even inanimate or animate reservoir, and there may be portal of exit through it. Mode of transmission, the most important mode of transmission in NICU is contact, through contact. For preventing hospital infections, so there is a system of uh, Hospital Infection Control Committee and even our uh, institute having this committee. And they are supposed to, uh, this is a basically a multidisciplinary committee where there's a physician, ICU uh, physician, even sister in charge, senior sister and sister in charge are the part. And microbiologist, epidemiologist, they are also the part and hospital administrator side even they are the part of this. And their role is to guide prevention and control of infections in incorporating guidelines, in antimicrobial policies, in surveillance policies, disinfection policies. And from time to time, in fact, they should come out with recommendation that this particular disinfectant is supposed to be most effective and it has to be reviewed periodically. So disinfection policies has to be laid down by this committee isolation policies, and even policies for investigation of an outbreak when it occurs. So the system is existing in our hospital as well. Now coming to uh, management, outbreak management. So the main objective of outbreak investigations and its management is to determine the cause of outbreak, to determine the source of infections and extent of outbreak, how severe is, what are the extent of involvement, and to determine the best control policies and even for future direction to prevent such happenings. So these are the main objectives. And uh, there are various steps. I've written 12 steps, but one can realize that many of these steps can be done at the same time. And many of the steps can be done at in different orders. So there are uh, scope to alter it. And sometimes, depending upon the outbreak situations, some steps may be uh, like uh, modified. Okay, so these are the broad steps, and we will just go through one by one. So first is establishing 
for accepting that outbreak has occurred. So this is based on the information on number of potential cases. So as I said, that depends on how many numbers, what are the possible organism, whether it's multi-drug resistance, then you can decide that, that it is probably an outbreak. Severity of problems, available microbiologies, demographic data of case, place and time. So depending on these, one can declare that it's an outbreak. Preparation. So one should prepare a team must be. So team is already, it's a multidisciplinary team and there is a very important role of microbiologist and many times it is a leader, microbiologist is a leader of the outbreak investigations. There must be uh, adequate infrastructure that has to be ensured and also one must review the similar outbreaks if there is uh, any literature or records. Verifying diagnosis or case confirmations. This is based on the clinical uh, this, uh, clinical records and uh, laboratory parameters. And then defining the case and identifying the further cases in the unit over a period of time. So one can adopt an, any standard definition or one can devise a new definition and that should be elaborated and should be crystal clear. And to identify more and more cases, one can rely on microbiology report on your uh, uh, surveillance records and even medical and clinical records. So one have to identify various cases over a time. Describe the cases or line listing or uh, deriving an uh, epidemic curve. So all one need to summarize the information based on various demographic clinical data and exposure times. And basically, um, time and persons, all data should be uh, uh, regarded. And one should uh, make an epidemic. Uh, sir, we cannot hear you. Uh, sir, we cannot hear you and the slides are also stuck. If you could hear me. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience. I think sir has some uh, technical issues. He'll be joining back soon.
sir your slides are visible sir your uh, mic is off yes sir yes so uh, this was covered epidemic ka arpita we were on this slide sir it needs yes. to be discussed yes sir so uh we'll just begin with this slide okay all right so uh, the other steps like verifying the diagnosis or case confirmation so this is based on the clinical uh, records and laboratory finding so you can confirm the case and then you have to define and identify or find more and more cases so for defining case you can adopt and any standard definitions or you can devise a new definitions based on clinical and microbiological data okay. for identifying more and more cases you can rely on microbiology reports or your surveillance data or your clinical medical records okay. and then the next step is to describe cases or line listing or and drawing epidemic curve so this basically summarizes the data the informations based on demographic clinical data and exposure information based on time place and person so you can uh, draw a graph epidemic curve which is basically an graphical representation of distribution of cases with time and the slope and pattern of this epidemic curves gives a clue towards whether it's a common point source or common persistent source intermittent source or propagated source so it gives lot of information and then uh, formulating an hypothesis so this is basically uh, that to develop a relation formulate what is the type of infection whether it is derived from exogenous source or within hospital endogenous source and about the possible route of transmission and the next step is to evaluate hypothesis that is to establish relationship of a disease with a specific cause and for this you can compare your hypothesis with uh, established facts or you can adopt an epid analytic epidemiological methods like case control or cross sectional methods and then next is additional information like microbiological investigation and this is one of the very important component of your investigations so there must be a surveillance culture of patients from various specimens may be surface stool even secretions blood cultures depending on the type of outbreak and then healthcare workers should also be screened from environment this may be wall surface equipment surface your water your sterilized even objects your uh, humidifier your tap water okay so various sampling from environments and then equipments these all should be done and then epidemiological typing of isolate okay using uh, genetic and molecular methods one should adopt to find out the exact source and the type and then implementing general control measures so in reality this should be done as early as possible to prevent further cases so one have to adopt policy of isolating the patients who hurting of patients keeping the patients of similar type of infection to a specific areas or even hurting of healthcare personnel is required the person involved in care the health personnel involved in care of particular type of group of patients should not be involved in care of other group of patients so many times if you are having sufficient staff even coating of health personnel is required so there must be proper spacing ideally 3 meter distance but if it is not at least more than 1 meter distance should be maintained once at times one require restricting admission and even closing the unit for temporary that depending on the severity of your outbreak ah uh, just uh, transmission based precautions so contact precaution is one of the very important components so one must follow standard precautions use of appropriate personal protective equipments special handling of equipments 
patient placement already discussed, minimizing patient transfer or transports, droplet precautions. Droplets are basically, these are more than five micron droplets and usually produced with coughing, sneezing, and even talking, doing uh, nebulizations, intubations. Okay, so these are the various droplet producing things. And airborne precautions, here the particles are of less than five micron size and they are circulating, keeps from circulating in the environment. So one must follow the proper ventilations, okay, proper air exchange, and even if it is not there, then one can create negative air circulations. Ideally, for whenever you want to keep the air pure inside your unit, so you should uh, ensure about the proper air circulation and you can adopt even vapor filters. And uh, wearing masks and for airborne precautions, N95 mask is uh, recommended. So these are few recommendations for uh, airborne infections and droplet infections. Immediate general control measures. So one must emphasize and educating all healthcare workers how to prevent infections. One should enhance hand hygiene practices, use of PPV, how to wear and how to dispose it, intensification of housekeeping and disinfection routines, strengthening of disinfection and sterilization of equipments, fumigation and foggings, adherence to aseptic pro protocol and procedures. Uh, hand washing, you all know, this concept was in laid way back in 1846. Sammy Lewis, he introduced the concept of hand hygiene with chlorinated liquid, and he was called to be savior of mothers. So he first used to prevent or minimize piperial sepsis. So this was way back in 1846. And this uh, diagram depicts what are the areas which are more contaminated or left out even after improper hand washing. So these are the usually webs, fingertips, knuckles. So these are the areas which are usually missed. Uh, you all know hand washing steps and it should be done in 40 to 60 seconds is the usual recommended time. But the important point here is uh, there should be a take sufficient quantity of antiseptic to, to uh, uh, this uh, water, uh, about water supply. So there must be running water supply. It should not be stored water. It should not be stored water. So this is very important. In stored water, there are many organisms which can grow. So it should be running water. It should not be stored more than 24 hours and it has to be the tank must be clean and one should use preferably use liquid soap the solid soap usually the cracks it has been found that it contains bacteria sometimes uh, bacteria grows in the cracks and two minute hand washing is recommended for scrub hand washing for before any surgical procedures otherwise 40 to 60 minutes second of hand washing is sufficient but it has been found that even uh, the hand rub with antiseptic is appears to be more effective, but both has a place. And I'm coming to next slide about hand rub. So at entry point, wherever your hand is grossly contaminated, one should stick to hand washing. And in between, after seven to 10 application of hand rub, there's a biofilm formation. So again, you have to wash your hand. So these are the few things where you must decide hand washing and then you should use hand rub. Hand rub, again, one should uh, uh, follow this guideline that he should take sufficient amount of antiseptic. Usually two to three ml of antiseptic should be taken and one must follow the steps just like hand washing. And usually let the antiseptic get evaporated then only it will be uh, active. Otherwise, it will be useless. Okay, so these are the few things. And usual time is recommended is 20 to 30 seconds for hand rub. But this is very important that after seven to 10 applications, one must wash their hand because there is a biofilm formations and disinfectant may not be active, may not remain active. There are five moments of hand hygiene before patient's contact, before aseptic task, after body fluid exposure, 
after patient contact and even after contact with patient surroundings. So these are the five moments where hand hygiene must be followed. Intensification of housekeeping and disinfection routines. The floor in each shift, walls in every shift, it should be clean. Window AC or even ducts of central ACs. It must be clean once in a week. Refrigerator, bucket, sink, mop head. Mop head, again, I am emphasizing that mop head, it must be washed in soap and water and disinfect with hypochlorite, chlorine containing solutions because this is one of the very potential area, very potential region for clostridium growth, clostridium depsily, the mop. If you're not taking care of mopping, especially the floor, cleaning of the corners, so you might land up into clostridium depsily outbreak. So this is a very important part. Baby's linen and blanket must be autoclips, feeding utensils and palladies, washed, boiled, or even uh, oven one can use for this. Swap container, injection, medicine, tray, set for procedures, chittel, all should be autoclaves. Strengthening your disinfection and sterilization of equipment. So for uh, this, you can use Sidex, okay? Your embo bag and all, you, it can, you can use uh, Sidex and if you keep it in for, for four to six hours, so you it might achieve uh, sterilization, or even you can use plasma sterilization. And this facility is not available in our uh, trauma centers and even at Kidmary. Uh, Two percent bacillosit can be used for weighing machine, warmer, and incubators. The sprit at uh, seventy percent alcohol can be used to clean uh, laryngoscope blade, thermometer, props, BP cup, measuring tape, stethoscope. About fumigation. So fumigation by using formalin or potassium permanganate method. So this fumigation was a practice at various centers and including our centers till last few years, but it has its own hazards. So the unit has to be vacated for three to four days even. And it produced a lot of uh, this formaldehyde gas, which is quite irritant and even potentially carcinogenic. So this use of this formalin and KMNO4 method is now, uh, it's uh, minimized and almost many centers have give up, given up using this methods. About fogging. So this is uh, uh, nowadays uh, recommended methods. So So your network is lost, I think. Sir is logging in again. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, sir, please uh, unmute yourself. Yes. So, I was, yeah, yeah, why is this clear, Arpita? Yes, sir, it is. 
So, uh, as I said, uh, fumigation is no more uh, being done at many centers because the chemical used is quite irritant and even carcinogenic. So, fogging is uh, uh, done even at our center, we have uh, changed to this fogging practices. And here, many uh, chemicals or disinfectant can be used, like MI fog, which contains quaternary ammonium compound. Contact period is one hour. Bacillosid, 1%. Again, contact period is one hour. Ecosil, which contains which uh, contains hydrogen peroxide. So this is uh, Ecosil, in fact, supposed to be very effective because it takes care of even costidium bacilli many spores which are left out with other chemicals and even certain viruses, certain non-enveloped viruses like norovirus, which causes diarrheal outbreak. So these are all covered with ecosil. And even there are, uh, 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 say, uh, some herbal preparations are also uh, available in market for fogging and they claim that it takes care of all spores and viruses. Them. So this practice is uh, nowadays being done. And here, you can have your unit ready within three hours or so. So this is another advantage. You need not to shut down unit for a long time. Adherence to aseptic protocols like preparation of cord, weighing, regarding SpO2, feeding, suctioning, changing wet nappies, preparing and administrating injections. So various procedures, protocols have to be revised and standardized. And one should ensure that this is being followed up. You can make your own bundle care to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonias, catheter-associated sepsis, like that. You can make a different uh, bundle of care which must be practiced to minimize these uh, infections. Preparation and giving medication. Again, uh, I'm not going into detail, but one must ensure one needle, one syringe, one medication, and one patient. One should try to avoid sharing same oil with multiple patients. So these are some standard practices one to follow. Laminar flow, this, this is uh, very important to check uh, infections through injections while TPN preparation and while preparing for IV fluid. So this should be prepared under laminar flow system. And we are following uh, this laminar flow. Uh, about uh, biomedical waste, I'm not going into detail, but it has to be followed strictly. How to manage a spill. So again, there is a standard guideline one must follow about managing the used and clean linen. Okay, so there should be, must be separate exit for used linen. And one should try to minimize contamination of grossly contaminated linens and less contaminated linens, okay? So, non-infected patients, their linen must be disposed separately. About specific control measures, so uh, depending on the recommendation by this investigating team, one can use certain measures. So, specific antimicrobial for affected patients based on your culture and Culture reports, identification and treatment of carriers and colonization, identification and elimination of contaminated products, modification of nursing procedures, rectification of lapses in clinical techniques or procedure. So these are all basically many recommendations comes from this investigating team and one have to adopt and follow these. Uh, many times, as I said, decolonization. So for like MRSA, there's a recommendation, antiseptic bath, and even use of mepurosin ointment in the nasal mucosa. So mepurosin nasal application. So this is used for MRSA decontamination, something like that. About communicating the findings. So basically these reports, this provides a blueprint for action. So it must be communicated. There must be a meeting and oral briefing with whole of the units, including staff nurses and even health workers. So all should be involved so that they can realize the importance of everything. So oral briefing is must, and then there must be a written report that has to be copy, must be given to the unit concern, and it has to be kept for future uh, help in the hospital records as well. So, and finally, the final step is one have to maintain the surveillance. 
So surveillance, you all know, it's a, a cycle of actions. There must be a data collection and reporting and analysis, and it is followed by appropriate action. So that is called surveillance, monitoring along with actions, necessary actions. And there must be active surveillance of the unit as well, active surveillance. They should come periodically, or even they should actually come as a surprise to take the samples and to see the practices. Okay, so even there must be active surveillance and it must be at surprise rather than declaring the date and this thing. And these are the last uh, two, three slides. So few of the response measure to infection outbreak. So this is uh, outbreak and this happens over one year when there was already ongoing infection control quality improvement program. And this is uh, this has been published in 2020. And this is from uh, St. John's Bangalore hospitals. And they, the, their unit consisted of 30 bedded NICU with 40 staff nurses and five doctors. There were three outbreaks reported during year 2018. The first outbreak was colonization with multi-drug resistant gram-negative bacilli. So they have defined outbreak as infants three or more colonized with same MDR algorithm comprised an outbreak or a blood culture with single MDR was also considered as an outbreak. So 11 infant they found to be colonized, nine were with Klebsiella. The source, they took sample from environment, from personnel, but they were unable to find out the source in this uh, outbreak investigations. The action recommended was strengthening hand hygiene, cohorting, and isolation of infant, and uh, this uh, non-touch, aseptic non-touch technique for handling of milk and human uh, this uh, uh, human will fortifier and probiotics. So this was recommendation, but they are unable to establish the causal relations. The Second outbreak which has been reported from same hospital was outbreak with methicillin resistant staph aureus. Here, definition adopted was three or more colonized with same MRC organism comprised an outbreak or even single case with blood culture positivity. Six infant found to be symptomatic and bacterial bacteria was isolated. The source identified after investigation was a maternal wound, caesarean wound, swab was positive for MRSA, and this mother was basically doing KMC for the baby. And two of the nasal swab from healthcare personnel were also positive. So probably these two uh, were the source of infection to the baby outbreak. Action recommended was strengthening of hand hygiene and uh, this ICP, screening of healthcare personnel, parental counseling, hand wash is a must in stable site cohort before exiting. Even after, while exiting from one area, one have to wash your hand and one have to change the protective devices. So this was uh, recommended and even decolonization was done of to those health workers who found to be having carriers. The third outbreak was with multi-drug resistant acinetobacter. Here, five infant were affected, four died. Infant were labeled as suspect who has only symptoms, probable if symptom and is screen, sepsis is screen positive, and definite cases if blood culture was positive. The source, after investigation, they found that one outborn baby was supposed to be an probable index case, but that baby died within 24 hours and culture report was available after three, four days. So by that time, actually, the spread has occurred to other. The spread of infection was due to poor hand hygiene and lack of bundle care. And this was attributed due to shortage of nurses. Earlier, the unit had 40 nurses, but subsequently, uh, there were only 27 nurses. So they also attributed that because of shortage of nurses, some practices have been uh, breached, and that's why the spread occurs. So action recommended was cohorting of new units, education of health care personnel on the central line associated with blood stream infections, all health care workers.
I think we have again lost sir. He will be connecting maybe in a few minutes. Yes, sir. Uh, bus, bus, uh, sound clear? Yes. yes, it's clear. Sir. Yeah. So the last two slides may be varicella yes. outbreak. So a varicella outbreak may be live. So your slides are uh, not visible, sir. Slides are visible? No? No, no sir. So you have to uh, start sharing. Share a screen, sir. Share screen, sir. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. So. Uh, varicella outbreak. Uh, a varicella outbreak may be life-threatening uh, in neonatal units. So you all know it is spread by uh, this airborne spread. And uh, isolation of cases is must to check the further spread. Treatment of cases should be done with using acyclovir. Even isolation of contacts with monitoring for secondary cases is required. And most often the source are either relatives, attendant, mothers, or healthcare workers. So prophylaxis for contacts recommended is uh, varicella-specific immunoglobulins with or without acyclovir. And perinatal maternal varicella, you all uh, remember that it is very uh, serious conditions. Baby is at very high risk of dying if mother contract varicella five days before and two days after, till two days after delivery. So this is time when baby is at maximum risk. Here, VZIG, varicella specific immunoglobulin is recommended. And for preterm baby, even up to 10 day, 10th postnatal day, VZIG must be given to minimize the chances of infections. For other post exposure uh, vaccination, for children more than one year, or even adult who are not vaccinated earlier, or and are susceptible, they must receive vaccination within three to five days of varicella exposure. Okay, so these are the about varicella. And this photographs, uh, we remember, this is photographs for our unit. And this baby was a neonate who contacted uh, varicella from mother. And then following varicella, he developed scalded uh, skin syndrome, staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. And he was admitted in our unit and subsequently he developed toxic shock syndrome and we lost that patient. So this is a very classical example, varicella getting complication and developing shock and we lost these patients. Uh, another uh, outbreak has been reported is pertussis outbreak from neonatal units. So pertussis, you all know, this may be a life threatening, especially for a young infant. 
it is pertussis it is highly infectious with a secondary attack rate of tune of 90% or so so susceptible are bound to almost develop infections so it is again spread by droplet incubation period 4 to 21 days and the patient may have cough vomiting apnea apnea is a very important presentation and there is recurrent blue discolorations patient may have at times respiratory distress encephalopathy convulsions even intracranial hemorrhage okay so these are the various presentations typically on tlc we get hyperleukocytosis with relative lymphocytosis and diagnosis can be further confirmed by culture or even pcr and pertussis toxin immunoglobulin in serum so these are the diagnostic confirmations isolation of cases and contact is recommended and droplet precaution must be followed chemo prophylaxis for contact with using azithromycin and treatment of cases can be done by use of erythromycin for 14 days or clarithromycin for 7 days and tdap vaccination must be ensured for healthcare workers so this is x ray uh, where in pertussis you can get peri bronchial opacities okay so especially the newborn they are prone for developing pertussis pneumonia and the very peculiar feature is peri bronchial infiltrates and uh, again uh, neonatal pertussis and under recognized health burden and rational for maternal immunizations so you must be aware that nowadays even mothers there is a recommendation from obstetric uh, groups and even from iap that mothers should receive tdap containing pertussis vaccine around uh, 13 to 16 uh, 26 weeks of pregnancy to protect newborn from varicella because there is formation of antibodies igg may be transferred to the babies and even iga protective antibodies may be uh, secreted in the milk that is protective for uh, newborn against pertussis so these are recommendations uh, by indian authority even so this is the last uh, slide to summarize so health care associated infections can be prevented if you follow if you have a system of surveillance in your unit or hospital if you follow universal precautions appropriate uh, protective equipments good housekeeping asepsis adequate and trained staff proper waste disposal and judicious use of antimicrobial so probably will you not on encounter with outbreak otherwise you, it is inevitable to have an outbreak or infections in your unit and then you have to follow all the steps which we already discussed so this was all about this topic and these were some of the uh, resources which has been taken so thank you uh, thank you all for your patience listening thank you sir that was such a wonderful presentation and uh, thank you for updating us on how to manage a infectious outbreak in icus i would like the audience if they have any queries sir will be so happy to take them so i believe there are no queries uh, so carrying on with our uh, session